folks, welcome back. I'm your host, RR Slugger, and today I wanted to have a quick discussion about a mainstay element of the channel, the Slugometer. First introduced in my video about Zalax Racers, this three-point grading system has been a useful tool when discussing the various LEGO sets within a series. However, there is a bit of nuance to this rating system that I wanted to explore a bit further today, so let's dive right in. Firstly, the Slugometer was brought to life by channel artist and co-founder Brett. At first, we were unsure if we wanted something physically built out of LEGO or not. In the end, we opted for a graphic that better matched some of the others that pop up from time to time. Ideally, the Slugometer was made to be something simple and straightforward. A three-point rating scale seemed like the perfect amount of variance to me. I have a real pet peeve about internet reviewers ranking things out of 10, but then only ever using the numbers 6 through 9 to grade the items they review. Why have 3 out of 10 as an option if you're not going to use it? What's the fundamental difference between a 3 out of 10 and a 4 out of 10? No, the Slugometer needed to be more concise and meaningful than that. Personally, I like tier ranking systems, and initial scripts for my Rock Raiders retrospective back in the day actually included this aspect. Ultimately, I dropped it because 8 sets spread across nearly just as many tiers didn't make a lot of sense to me. What if I didn't feel any sets within the theme warranted a C or lower? Then my system is no better than the ones I just ridiculed. What the Slugometer needed was relativity, the final crucial component. I've been watching SF Debris' Star Trek reviews for over a decade now, and I think it was him who first turned me on to this idea. Whatever your ranking system is, it should be relative to the series you're reviewing. Now, Chuck got to use this almost comedically at times. In some videos, he would go on at length about some dumb Voyager episode, ripping it apart in front of our eyes, only to, at the end, award it a 6 out of 10, meaning that it's actually above average for the series. Yikes. <laughs> Remember when Voyager was the bad one? I do. Anyways, additionally, this helps alleviate the problem that many other rating systems have, that being their nebulous nature. What exactly is 5 out of 10 worthy? What are you comparing it to? In the case of SF Debris, Voyager episodes were compared to other Voyager episodes, Deep Space Nine episodes were compared to other Deep Space Nine episodes, and so on. Keeping the rankings independent from each other is important to me. A 10 out of 10 episode of Voyager is not a perfect hour of television. It's simply the best the series was able to achieve when compared to its brethren. Likewise, a 3 out of 3 on the Slugometer does not denote a perfect LEGO set. Instead, it indicates that I consider the set to be in the upper echelon of releases within that series. In the same vein, a 1 out of 3 score does not necessarily mean the set is bad, it means I don't consider it as strong as its peers. I think this is a really important distinction to keep in mind when judging Slugometer ratings. For example, I don't think there's a single bad Rock Raider set, but because they're ranked against each other, it means that some have to fall lower on the scale while others score higher. Because of this, a great Rock Raider set like the Chrome Crusher may only score two slugs because of the stiff competition. This idea of a scoring system based on relativity is by no means unique, but it's the one I gravitated towards for the reasons listed earlier. However, there is a distinct drawback to this system, and I knew it going in. The slugometer requires context to operate correctly. That means if I don't have all the sets from a given series, I can't offer an informed score. I can't give a meaningful rating to a set that I lack contextual experience for. So what if I feel this is a 2 out of 3 slug set. What does that even mean if it's the only original Blacktron I own? Hopefully this long-winded breakdown is making some sense, or at least is revealing my thought process behind it. Because of this limitation, the slugometer has to be used sparingly, and only when I feel I have enough background to make an informed judgment. I know some folks are disappointed that the Slugometer isn't appearing in the Orient Expedition retrospective series as we go along, but I want to wait until the finale before codifying anything. My opinions of sets often change slightly as I work with them when making these videos, so it's a rating system better used in retrospect rather than on the go. Now, with all that being said, you were promised Empire Strikes Back, so let's get into it. 
In my Snow Speeders Are Grey and Always Have Been video, I presented my rather enlightened case for the Snow Speeders actually being grey in the original trilogy, not white. By the way, I didn't even include this scene, perhaps the most damning piece of evidence. This is the only shot in the movie where the AT-ATs and Snow Speeders interact without the use of compositing. Doesn't that just spell it out? Anyways, within the video, I also give a quick slugometer ranking of all three of the original Star Wars movies. Now, I didn't elaborate on this at all, and that was intentional. Call it trolling if you want, but I think there's some genuine humor here. Regardless, I stand by my rankings. However, given how the slugometer functions, this doesn't mean I don't like The Empire Strikes Back. In fact, I do like it. I just don't like it as much as the other two films I was scoring it against. To me, Empire suffers a bit from being the midsection of a trilogy, similar to Back to the Future Part 2. While a great sequel to A New Hope and a fine continuation of the overarching story of the series, I don't find that it stands as strongly as its own film compared to the other two. While I Am Your Father is a neat twist, to me the aftermath of this revelation explored in Jedi is far more interesting than the revelation itself. I've always had issues with the through line within Empire, and I find it to be significantly lacking in narrative thrust when compared to its immediate peers. Obi-Wan appears to Luke in a vision to tell him where the next quest marker lies. Luke then conveniently crashes his X-Wing next to Yoda's house on a planet he was completely unfamiliar with. <laughs> You could make the argument that it was the will of the force, or that you're just nitpicking, and you might even be right, but small things like this erode what little cohesion I felt these scenes had to each other already. My exacerbation intensifies when the B story of Han can't fix his own ship ends up becoming half the movie. Why can't he fix it? Why was it broken? Ultimately, questions like this shouldn't matter, but this isn't a one-liner dropped at the start of a Star Trek episode about the inability to use the transporter through the planet's ionosphere or some nonsense. The movie continually comes back to remind me of these questions over and over without any intention of answering them. In a lesser movie, we would call this contrived writing. Now, a movie like Return of the Jedi is not without its problems obviously. I don't love the Ewoks either, but many of the other high points really resonate with me. The whole affair with Jabba on Tatooine is my favorite opening section of any Star Wars movie, and I just love what they decided to do with Luke's character in this one. In light of his new revelation, he's finally at peace, and yet so driven. It's, it's kind of unsettling, but cool. Meeting the Emperor in the flesh is exciting, and I adore the dynamic between him and Vader. The Emperor doesn't hesitate to mock Vader's abilities right to his face, and seems to be seething with dark side powers Jedis could only dream of. Of course, I still view this movie through a lens untainted by the prequels, which managed to sully pretty much everything here. <laughs> Take your Jedi weapon, strike me down, sure meant a lot more before every bad guy had a red lightsaber because they were a bad guy. Even an annoying comic relief character like C-3PO has a ton to do in this movie. In fact, he has more to do in the first 20 minutes of this film than he had in the entire runtime of Empire. If he's got to be there, if Anthony Daniels has fifth billing for some reason, at least give his character a reason to be there. It's a small scene, but C-3PO's retelling of their adventures to the Ewok villagers is genuinely heartwarming to me. It adds a sense of gravity and grandeur to the finale. Oh, and Jedi has the best saber duel in the franchise, maybe the best dolly shot in cinema. Is that even debated? Anyways, hopefully this clears the air. Ultimately, I hope you take away two things from this video. Firstly, the slugometer is a rating system that relies on relativity that ranks things according to the context they're surrounded by. The second point is that these are just opinions of one slug on the internet. So what if I don't like The Empire Strikes Back as much as you do? Why should that impact your life? The same goes for LEGO sets. Inevitably, there's going to be a few we disagree on, and that's okay. Unless you like Mars Mission, then you're just wrong. <laughs>